guitar number 106. So guitar 106, I'm building for David in California. This is a commissioned build. This is the back set that we decided upon. We were looking at uh, a bunch of different samples. I went to Hearn Hardwoods, as I usually do, and picked through the stacks. Yesterday, I used a number five jack plane, and I always use my leveling beam as a part of my jointing process on the shooting board. Here, we'll go over here and check it out. This is a very critical part of my jointing process. With just the number five jack plane alone, I can't get a an absolutely perfect joint. I know maybe some people can with just the plane, but I always use this with some 220 grit sandpaper at the end after planing to get that just perfect, completely seamless joint on my light box here. Okay. In addition to joining the back plate, I also bent the set of sides. So here are my side bending carousels, or th this is my side bending carousel, that's what I call it, um, which is really just a workbench with four different side bending machines so that I can bend uh, enough sides for two guitars at once. Uh, I only did one guitar in this case, so these two machines were used and in this case, I thicknessed the Nicaraguan rosewood to 85 thousandths of an inch. Probably could have done 90 thousandths of an inch. I'm sure it would have been fine. But since this was a very unique set, it made the sides irreplaceable, right? So in cases like that, where I, don't, I can't easily get a new set of sides to replace it aesthetically, I like to err on the side of caution and just make it a little bit thinner before loading it up um, to avoid compression marks and cracks and things like that. Probably would have been fine at 90 thousandths of an inch. That's what I usually do though. Okay, so I've got it wrapped here in aluminum foil and inside the aluminum foil is parchment paper. I always wrap my sides, regardless of the species, I wrap them in aluminum foil and parchment paper. All right, success. So that is our gorgeous, it really is a just a gorgeous piece of wood, this Nicaraguan rosewood, especially once I clean it up and you know get rid of some of the uh, marks from the bending process. Cool. This was my favorite part of yesterday making this custom rosette for David. So you'll notice right away that w one thing I wanted to do with this was I wanted to, and actually I didn't uh, talk to David about this at all, but I wanted to use the stripe that we have here and somehow pull it. And you can actually see that lines up really well with it right there, that looks cool and pull that stripe onto the rosette, right? So I'm taking an element from elsewhere on the guitar and using it here. Now, I actually constructed this rosette using the radial rosette maker, which we'll talk about in a moment. And I constructed it in such a way as to have a backup plan. So the rosette 
will always be covered by the fretboard tongue at the top portion. And um, I'm not really sure in the end when I cut the channel and press this in there, I'm not really sure if I'm gonna like having this little element down here at the bottom, the sapwood. So my rip cord here, so to speak, my plan B is to just put that down there if I want more of a, just a simple look. And that does look really good just like that. It still is pulling something from a different part of the, the guitar because this wood actually came directly from this back plate. The individual wedges that compose this radial rosette came from right off the bottom of the plate right here, and some of them came from the top as well. So that's how I got that, okay? Now I always make these radial rosettes using the radial rosette maker jig. By the way, this is a jig that I designed myself and I sell and produce here in the shop. So if you guys are interested in one of these jigs, check it out at ericshaferguitars.com. I have uh, several of them uh, already made right now and, and ready to be shipped. So uh, ericshaferguitars.com. The way this works uh, in a nutshell essentially is that there is a wedge template that goes right here and you can cut you cut the individual wedges from a strip of wood and again in this case this strip of wood was rescued from the back plate and so that gives you your individual tapered wedges which you assemble under this circle clamp and then you can cut out your rosette using a dremel with a circle cutting jig attached to the center pin right here there's even an alternate pin location if you want to do offset rosettes now as you can see uh, the blocks are attached and the side braces are installed so first i attach these two blocks uh, it's always important to keep in mind what kind of radius you have at the block locations in this case for this model there is no radius at the neck block location this is dead flat so that's easy the block is easy to conform to this shape prior to glue up this however is a slight continuous curve it happens to be a 49 inch radius this curve right here so i actually have a contour board a special board that i sand this end block on to get it to match up with this exact radius before I glue it up. With rosewood in particular, by the way, and this is rosewood, it's important to remove the oils that may or may not be present at the surface before you glue anything. So actually before I attach the blocks or the braces or anything, and I just had these loosely in the mold, I sanded the whole thing to 220 grit and wiped it down with mineral spirits, which removes those oils present at the surface, and then naphtha, which just cleans up the mineral spirits. And then the naphtha just wicks away. It's very evaporative. So that's just good prep work right there. Then I attach the blocks, and then I turn my attention to the side braces. And what's nice about this setup is I actually don't have to wait for these, the, for the glue to cure on these. Uh, before I can start work on those side braces. I can just get right into it. The clamps here don't get in my way at all. And then after that, in preparation for installing the kerfing, I put the radius, or the taper I mean, on the back side. So this is the back. So this is tapered at an angle towards the neck block, okay? And I gave it a 12 foot radius, which is a nice round radius. It's a good doming for the back. And on the top side, there's a 30 foot radius. Of course, I'm going to radius again a, a second time once the kerfing is on there. All right, let's jump over to the soundboard. Not much to talk about here, but I just wanted to share that the rosette is now installed. Check that out. So I talked about before how um, I was considering putting a cool sapwood stripe at the bottom here but but i had a backup plan to just spin this around and put the sapwood underneath the fretboard if i didn't like the way it looked well as you can see i didn't like the way it looked so i went with this much cleaner look 
it doesn't have that striking feature but it's simple and it's clean so it's elegant so i i wanted to go with that there were just some uh i just thought the grain didn't look good over here uh, by the way that gap is intentional so and that's a good thing to talk about whenever i install a solid wood rosette or a radial ro rosette like this i always separate it at that point uh, that goes underneath the fretboard so that the rosette is then flexible if i keep the rosette as a solid ring it's actually harder to get it to fit without gaps in your rosette channel but if you just break it somewhere then it can actually move a little bit which allows it to conform to the channel for my modified lattice bracing system that i like to use for the backs on my orchestra model size instruments so i say modified because right now it looks like a true lattice or at least like a double x bracing i would say if it was really a true lattice bracing you would have an extra set of lattice joints down here at the bottom and possibly a little more at the top maybe not because the neck block gets in the way but what i do here instead and you can see the pencil line here and here i just do a cross beam or cross strut, nobody really uses the word beam in <laughs> uh, bracing for acoustic guitars. I guess I'll be the first. A cross strut here, transverse strut, running um, across here forming a triangle, which a triangle is an extraordinarily strong structure. So this not being a true lattice brace and it being a little bit modified like that, um, the reason I do that is because the center structure here which i'm calling sort of this portion i like to make that very very strong so that i can really whittle these braces down so they can be very very small but still strong at the same time so you'll get more stiffness with less mass at least in theory and then around the perimeter this whole thing will be nice and slim and sleek okay so these bars are going to be whittled down quite significantly around the perimeter of the back plate here. Now all this is keeping in mind, by the way, a sort of 80-20 rule, it might even be a 90-10 rule, which is not a real rule in Lutherium, just making this up on the spot, which is to say that the back plate is only like 20 or 10% the significance of the top plate, right? So you wanna put 80 or 90% of your effort and thought into what you do for the top plate. I like doing something like this for the back plate, but if I'm being honest with myself, I know that the real gains to be made in tone are with the top plate, simply because the top plate is excited by kinetic energy directly from the string, whereas the back plate is excited by resonant energy. So it's a much more indirect. And just to have a visual representation of what I'm talking about, there will be a strut running across there and another one uh, somewhere down at the bottom. That's all work for me to do later today. So let's take a look at the lattice itself and just talk about how we got here. So a lattice brace is similar to how an X brace is constructed. In fact, it's the same. There's just more lap joints. Okay. So each one of these is a lap joint. A lap joint is simply it's a notch cut on each beam. So let's say there's a notch on this side and a corresponding notch on this piece. And then the two notches just bite into each other. I would take this apart to show you, but honestly, it's so tight that I don't want to do that. If you take a look at that, you can see that's a very tight joint. How do I get it that tight? One thing that I like to do is I cut these corresponding notches that I just talked about. I cut those to be... I'm not aiming for a precise fit. I'm actually aiming for a slightly undersized fit, a fit that's slightly too small. And because the this is spruce, a nice soft wood, if I have a fit that's very, very close, but just a hair too small, I actually like to just kind of force the two pieces together, which compresses the spruce a little bit at that point, but that's okay. As long as you're being reasonable about it. It's actually a nice way to do your joinery with softwood. 
before I go straight to the sanding dish, I can take a thumb plane or a finger plane and just remove the bulk of the material that way. And then I go to the sanding dish, my radius dish, and first I radius each piece individually, but then once the whole lattice is constructed, I can take this whole unit and very gently sand it in the dish just to fine tune it. Okay, so moving forward with today, the first thing I'm gonna do is glue down this whole unit right here and then attach those transverse connecting braces there that I talked about earlier. I've installed the braces on the back and on the top. So I'm ready to do some carving here. Let's go ahead and talk about, first of all, what I did to get these on here. So in this case here, my brace wood is Western Red Cedar, which is Fuja Placata. I always have an attitude of impartiality towards species when it comes to brace wood and top wood, especially. I'm, I kind of carry that attitude throughout guitar making to a certain degree, but I'm, I'm less interested in the name of the wood, the species, than I am in the quality that I can get within a given set of woods that luthiers typically use, okay? So I'm not gonna apply this to like balsa wood or something like that because there just isn't great balsa wood for this type of work. So I'm limited to various spruces and cedars essentially, more or less. And so I used Western red cedar on here because that was the best stock that I could find and the best stock that I had available here at the shop as well. Um, if I had better Sitka spruce, I would use that. So this is actually a Sitka spruce top actually. So Sitka spruce top, Western red cedar brace wood on the inside. Uh, functionally, as far as the, not functionally, but um, workability wise, the difference between Western red cedar and Sitka spruce is that Western red cedar is a lot more brittle. So you just have to be aware of that when you're cutting, say your lap joint, and later on today when I'm carving these braces. It wants to, the chisel wants to wedge itself under a grain line more so than it does with the Sitka spruce. It wants to tear along that grain. So I sourced my Western Red Cedar from various billets, sort of like this one that I have right here, just as an example. And I radiused all the braces. As I've talked about on different episodes of DIY Guitar Making, I radius all of the braces on the top um, including the upper bout braces, which a lot of luthiers will leave flat, but we won't get into that. So I radius all the braces, and the first thing I work on after radiusing all the braces is cutting this lap joint for the X brace. Okay, a lap joint is like two interlocking notches on each X brace arm. And so the X brace arms lock together like that. Uh, I always give a little final sanding on the X brace arms as a unit. I sand those two pieces together to get that final mate between the soundboard and the X brace just perfect. And then I glue the X brace down first because everything else is going to be fitted against the X brace. So procedurally, it makes sense to get the X brace on there first and then start fitting your other braces. So I do the X brace, then I'll do the bridge plate, then I'll do the tone bars, then the finger braces, then the sound hole braces up here, the transverse bar, and lastly, the fretboard graft, okay? Also during that process, I install the most important gram of wood on the entire bracing pattern. That's what Irvin Samaji calls this. And that is this little cap here that goes over the joint. Okay, it's a very small, thin piece of wood, but it's just an, enough to bridge over that joint, which restores the strength to this X brace arm. Okay, this X brace arm, because a notch was cut right in the center, a notch that uh, runs about halfway down the height of it, that significantly weakens 
this X brace arm so you can restore the strength to it by simply putting a cap over the top. It restores that full height to the brace and height is strength according to the cube rule uh, which we follow for braces. Okay, cube rule, just to remind you guys, is basically that by a factor of three, our braces are strong, get their strength from their height rather than from their width, which is why we always want the braces to be tall and skinny, not short and wide. What I did yesterday was the voicing and just the general carving of the braces for the top. So a big step, a very important step. Voicing, by the way, is the kind of thing that it wouldn't matter if you lived for a thousand years, you never, you will never, you should never expect to master voicing. It is just something you'll always be doing. Here's what I do. In a nutshell, there's a lot of weird little details here, but trying to keep this brief, flex the X brace arms. Okay. And hold it. And it's good to actually hold it at a variety of different nodes. It actually gives you a better idea of overall what the top, uh, how resonant the top is if you move this, my left hand around, the hand that's not the tapping hand, but the hand that's simply gripping it. Okay, that's what I mean by holding it at different nodes. I remember when I first started doing this, I thought that you had to hold it at, ex at one spot every time, the exact same spot. Um, and, and maybe some people have a process that involves that, but I have since realized that that's not at all the case. And you actually want to move that node, you know, the finger that's gripping it, you want to move that node around. Yeah, that sounds great. It really does. Feels good, sounds good. Okay. Um, so let's uh, talk in more practical terms here. Uh, talk about what I did. So I carved all the tapers. In, in the beginning, when you first start carving, you're not really voicing, you're not in that headspace yet. You're just carving out these tapers to a very uniform height so that we can create a nice joint at all four ends of the X brace and at these two ends of the transverse bar. And then after you get those tapers, then we can profile the, the braces, which basically means put this angle that you see into the braces. And then I voice, okay? We already talked about that. And now at this point, I'm just gonna kind of clean it up a little bit um, and sign it. You always want to radius not only the braces, but also the rim set. And then on the back of this, ugh, let's turn this around. Thing's heavy. On the back of this, I already have this radius after I put the kerfing on to a much greater curvature, which is a 12 foot radius. The back, you can always get away with a greater curvature than what you have on the top. What else to talk about here? Um, so these side braces, which run up all the way through the kerfing, which is a bit of a, uh, I'm not gonna say entirely, you, a lot of builders do it, but it's not, it's not the norm. It's not the orthodox thing to do. Normally the braces, just span between the kerfing strips, but I like to run them from plate to plate um, for just better purposes of better joinery, okay? Better fit. It makes more sense for the brace to span the full space between the plates rather than it to run between the kerfing, 
um, mostly just because you end up with a weak spot right where, right before where the brace meets the kerfing, it's going to be somewhat unsupported. So the other thing that I worked on on day six was finalizing this gorgeous modified lattice braced Nicaraguan rosewood back plate here. And one thing that really struck me is just how resonant that is. That is amazing. I profiled these, which just uh, takes off by shaving off some of the material, either with a chisel, which if you're very careful, you can do it with a chisel, or more preferred by most people, using a small plane, like a finger plane, or a thumb plane. I use both of these to get that work done and uh, a chisel to some degree. And what that does is it removes a lot of the mass off of the sides of the brace, putting sort of a, an angle onto the brace. By removing the mass off of the sides, you are not really cutting down on the height of the brace. So you're maintaining most of the strength of the brace while removing extra mass. And that's how you get ultimately a good resonant back plate like that. I always feel like I should mention when I talk about the resonance of back plates or anything about the tonal properties of the back plate, I always feel like I should mention that most of your efforts should be on the soundboard. The back is only indirectly affected by the, uh, the plucking of the string, right? When you pluck a string, all of that kinetic energy from the string goes directly into the top, and then that excites the cavity of air, which then indirectly excites the back. So, it makes sense to put most of your efforts tonally into the top. The back is a far uh, lesser tone producer, let's say. But still, a good guitar maker puts a whole lot of effort into everything and all those little parts add up to give you hopefully a good sounding guitar in the end. All right, there we have it. Here is the back all glued up to the rim set with, as you can see, just a cluster, almost use a bad word there, but a cluster of clamps holding it together there's uh, a lot of ways, a lot of different ways to attach the back to the rim set and none are really necessarily better than others. They all kind of work, but you know what? We'll talk about that in a second. Let me kind of go over uh, step by step what I did yesterday. So I installed a label. These are my labels, which I print out on parchment paper. So I installed that label and then clamped the back to the rim set so that I could mark out the locations of the brace ends that get tucked or notched into the kerfing. One little tip for marking out those notches, and this is actually something that I discovered recently. I used to clamp the back down and then just go around, take a pencil and make little marks where those brace ends stick out, but recently I realized that I can use this little pen knife attachment right here. So this is something that would be sold in the section of say a Michaels or an AC Moore. AC Moore's out of business, so scratch that. <laughs> sold in the section of a Michaels, they're still around, uh, where they would also keep the razor blades and things like that. So any hobby store should have something like this. You know what, I don't know what to call this. It's like a key, I would say this is a keyhole saw, but I'm gonna, uh, when I edit this video, I'll double check that and give you guys a little heads up on what this is so you can find it if you'd like. But basically this little saw here is skinny enough at the tip that when I clamp the back down for the purpose of marking out those notches, I can take this and just pl place it 
underneath the back and rest it right against the side of that brace and then just do a light filing on the kerfing and I get a perfect mark of where the edges of those braces are. Whereas when I do this with pencil, there's a little bit of, um, you're trusting your hand a little bit. There's some human error there. You might uh, make the line a little too fat or go off to the side a little bit more than you intended. It's a little harder to line it up by eye with a pencil. So for accuracy, try this out guys. A little keyhole saw, I'm calling it for now. And then I cut my notches. As I've talked about before, I have my two Dremel system. What I mean by that is I've got one Dremel with these plastic or acrylic really attachments that I've made. I, I customized this Dremel so that I can uh, use it to trim down the height of my brace ends very accurately. Okay, I've talked about that before. I'm not going to talk about that too much. And then this is the companion Dremel to this one because this is set to the same height, but essentially it's an inverse cut to what this is doing. So that way I get a perfect fit between my brace ends every time. Repeatability, consistency is a good thing. And then I run glue around the, the rim and clamp this whole thing down. Now you can see I have this clamped up with a bazillion clamps in my uh, go bar deck, which is attached to my shop stand. This is a special setup that I modified my uh, radius dishes to be able to be installed onto my shop stand like this, which I do this for a number of reasons. Um, not the least of which is the fact that it makes brace carving a lot more comfortable because I can just sit right under this table and carve right into the dish like that. But you guys might not have, probably won't have a setup like this. Um, but So just keep in mind there's, a, like I said, a hundred different ways to clamp this down. You can do this in the GoBar deck. If you're already using a GoBar deck to install your braces, you might as well also use the GoBar deck to glue the plates on. The next thing I have to do is install the top on here and the mold and the spreaders really help the sides to maintain their form. In fact, I leave the spreaders in when I glue the top, which you might think, well, then you can't get your spreaders out. But actually, all of these spreaders, each one breaks down into three individual components. So this bar here, the turnbuckle, is not attached to these pads. So when I loosen this, I can actually pull the bar out through the sound hole, then this piece, and then this piece, and etc. for these other two. So yeah, you can see the bracing pattern now, and the label right there. Oh, by the way, I just want to mention, if you don't have, you know, a lot of people have spreaders that are just single units, it's not that big of a deal to just take your spreaders out now and then install the top without any spreaders pushing up against the sidewalls. Uh, but I do find my sides are a little bit, just a little bit more square by leaving the spreaders in. I have installed the top and the top is installed in much the same way that the back is installed. So by marking where the transverse bar and where the X brace arms meet the kerfing at the edge and then cutting notches at all six of those locations. Okay, three notches on each side. And then just gluing the back down with good old tight bond, or I'm sorry, gluing the top down with tight bond, original. So this top feels really good. This is one of those things I always like to do with my soundboards is just give it a, a nice gentle press right at that bridge location. And you can get a real sense for the yield that this top gives. And that gives you a good sense of the responsiveness. And by the way, you can do this before you glue it down. Uh, after you cut those notches, you can just rest it in the notches and feel that responsiveness.
And then, you know, because it's not glued down yet, you can take it off and work on the braces a little bit more uh, until you get it good. Hey, just thought I'd show you the back as well. Pretty stunning. That sapwood line is just beautiful. All right. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to show you guys? Another thing that I worked on is I selected a fretboard. Actually, I had a couple stunning contenders here. I went through my stack and just found the coolest ones because in this case, I know that David, from speaking with him, that he likes woody character. He doesn't want um, just sort of jet black ebony. He likes seeing the streaky bits. So I found some really interesting streaky ones. And between all of these, I'm actually still between these two. Okay. This one I went ahead and cut the fret slots for. And I cut out the shape. I haven't refined the shape yet. That's why it looks, you know, kind of lumpy and uneven. I just simply cut it out on the bandsaw. What I'm going to do is cut slots into this one as well and cut out its shape just so honestly so that I can look at both of them and make a decision. I don't often do that with parts because it's a lot of extra work, but uh, I'm really undecided. Like I, they, they both have a character that works with the rest of the guitar, but in different ways. So there's this one, which is very light colored. I think that will be cool with the with everything else that's going on. And then this more ribbon like kind of figure on this one. It's just pretty cool. Um, and you know what? When I cut out these slots and cut this shape, it's not like this won't get used. Actually, one lucky uh, attendee of my guitar building workshops will end up getting this fretboard because I'm just going to use it for those guitar build workshops. So this will be a, a cool streaky piece of Macassar ebony that will end up on someone's guitar if I don't use it on this one. And finally, one other thing that I did the other day is I bent the ebony binding strips that I'm going to use for the binding. It's going to be a very simple binding purfling scheme. In fact, there won't be purfling on the top. It's just going to be the whole, gu the whole guitar body, the sound box, will be framed in ebony. It's simple and it's gorgeous. So let's uh, open this up and just take a look. So you can bend your binding strips in a side bending machine like I did here. Or you know what? You can very easily bend binding strips on a bending iron and like the ones they sell at uh, Luthier's Mercantile and uh, I think Stu Mac probably sells one too. You know what? That's actually a great way to learn and practice hand bending is to just do it with binding strips first. It's just easier. It's a lot more forgiving. Okay. But I always use a bending machine it's once you're you know how to use a bending machine it is by far the easiest way to do it and the most repeatable way to bend either your sides or binding strips so here it is just like when i bend a set of sides uh, in fact it looks just like a bent set of sides right now you might think that there's a set of sides in here because what i always do is i tape together a whole bunch of strips, binding strips, all together just like that. And I wrap them in the same uh, layers of parchment paper and aluminum foil, just like I do for a real set of sides. Now, if you look at this, you might think, well, that's a lot of binding strips. That's way more than I need for just one guitar. Um, that's just because I, I always load these up with as many binding strips as I can fit in there, because I always need ebony binding. It's the most common binding that I use. So a lot of these will end up on the guitars in the hands-on workshops this spring. Uh, some of them will end up on my own guitars that I'm working on. And uh, some of them will end up on commissioned builds. Okay, but four of these 
and only four is all I need for guitar 106. Before we install the head plate, it's good to have an understanding of what tuners we're going to use and therefore what our overall thickness between both the headstock piece here of mahogany and the head plate is going to be when we add these two together what's it going to be so that we don't uh, undershoot or exceed the maximum thickness that's allowed for these Steinberger gearless tuners I've talked about these tuners here in the channel a bazillion times at this point so you guys are sick of hearing about them but I will say uh, real quick that they're just a different concept of a tuning machine. They actually pull the string straight down into this shaft. They're gearless and they have the equivalent of a 40 to one tuning ratio, which simply means that they have super smooth tuning accuracy. It's really easy to incrementally just inch up on as precise of a tuning as you can possibly get. Uh, rather than tuners that have a really poor tuning ratio, like, I don't know, 4 to 1 or something like that, those are going to be really difficult to get into tune and to stay in tune. Anyway, they're cool. What I want to do right now, this would just barely work as a maximum thickness. Uh, I'm going to reduce the thickness of the head plate just a little bit. You may... By the way, notice that this head, head plate is very, very chunky and oversized compared to what you're probably used to looking at. Head plates are often called head plate veneers because they're thin like a veneer. But what I like to do a lot of the times is use a nice chunky piece of wood for the head plate. I think aesthetically it really just adds something to the headstock to have this. You almost have like the equivalent of a binding strip on the side when you view it like this, right? You get that nice black line along the side instead of something very, very thin like a veneer would be. But um, beyond aesthetics, also it provides a really strong, secure backstop for the nut, much more so than just a wimpy veneer of wood would allow. All right, so let's go ahead and thin this out just a little bit more because I don't want to be right at the maximum thickness. I want to shoot for a little bit lower than that just so I don't run into any problems. Okay, so now we've got 50, um, I'm sorry, 650, yeah, 650. So we lost 20 thousandths of an inch off of there. And that's good. I still like the that it has a, a chunkiness to it, like I mentioned. And I may actually countersink, I'm not sure yet, I may actually countersink the tuner heads slightly into the headstock, which is something I've done on other guitars and really liked, but um, we'll just see a little bit later. I have a lot of head, head plate here uh, to do that with, so I have some optionality, so I'm just going to keep that open for now. Alright, so I've got that pinned in place, my holes drilled, see that? And now I simply add glue and clamp the hell out of this thing.
Okay, time to work on this guy right here. We are gonna be installing abalone. Check those little guys out. Abalone face dots and abalone side dots as well, as per the request of David, uh, who I'm building this guitar for. He wanted to do the abalone instead of the mother of pearl. So check these out. I mean, this just, this just looks wild. Obviously, I'm not going to... Here, let's, let's install them like this. That'll look good. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not going to throw them randomly on here like this, but I just wanted to show you what they looked like against the actual fretboard. Wow, this one almost looks like Mother of Pearl here. I might not use that one, but that's why I got extra. There's a little tip for you, by the way. Always order extra. Yeah, this one looks good. Not on that face. Um, and if you like a particular face, the interesting thing is once you sand it even slightly, you'll see something totally different, uh, just one layer deeper down. So sometimes you'll be pleasantly surprised by that or maybe even disappointed uh, when you sand some of these back if you were expecting to maintain a very specific color pattern on one of these. So first, to locate my fret marker dots, all I have to do is draw X's in the fret spaces, the center of the X marks the spot where I want to drill. Using a Forstner bit leaves a flat bottom to your inlay pocket for the mother of pearl or the abalone to rest against. Okay, now we can turn our attention to the side dots, which will also be abalone. The first thing I'm doing is I'm using a preset marking gauge to score a single straight line along the side of the fretboard. On this line, I can inlay all of my dots. I just now have to find the centers between the appropriate fret spaces. Once I've punched out all my dot locations with an awl, I can use a hand drill to drill out the holes. Install the dots using a hammer and a small hard block to tap them into place. And then finally, apply some water thin super glue. Now let's go ahead and sand this back. Only takes a second here on a nice flat sanding board. And I could have clamped this down, but hey, we're done already. Well, almost. Look at that. That's pretty cool. So there's some glue shadow that's still there, but I'm not worried about that. This is all gonna get sanded further when I carve the neck. But I just really wanted to see, was excited to see how that abalone comes out on the, the black and the caramel of the Macassar Ebony. That's cool.
Okay, and here we are back at the headstock here. I've removed all the clamps, obviously. And we just have this lip here that I always leave when I glue these down. There's this lip that we have to cut back to reveal the true back edge of the nut slot. And the way that I do that, I'm gonna show you, I have a nifty little jig here. You see this jig has a little undercut cut into the bottom of this surface so that I can slide this right up over however much overhang that I have, which allows me then, because there's a fence keeping me flush against the side of the neck blank, and this is square to that fence, I can take a saw, a dovetail saw, uh, in this case I'm going to use a carcass saw, and I can cut right on that line and it will be square, both square in this direction, but also, most importantly, it's going to be square straight up and down to the fretboard bearing surface of the neck. Okay, and here comes the lawnmower guys, so uh, it's going to get loud. <laughs> Now when I cut this, I have to actually watch what I'm doing because there's really nothing stopping me from going right into the mahogany and I don't want to do that. So I'm, so I'm just creeping up down to the bottom of the ebony and stopping with just a razor thin margin of ebony left so I can then just break off that overhanging piece and clean up the remaining bit with the file. But again, it's with a big toothy saw like this, it's really easy to just get carried away and dig into the mahogany going a little too far. Um, I've definitely done that before, so I'm not going to do it here. We'll just pop that off of the chisel, nice and carefully. Basically just wedging it up, not actually using the cutting edge of the chisel, just the wedge shape to kind of pop that off. And there it is. All right, I've got my headstock shape drawn onto my neck blank here, and I'm ready to cut this out and shape it right down to those lines. The process ultimately is going to look like this. I'm going to first make some big bandsaw cuts just to relieve most of the material. Then I can take it over to the spindle sander to shape it real close to the line, and then finally, I'm going to finish this up on the robo sander, which is really like finishing it up uh, with a flush trim router bit. Many of you may be familiar with routing in that fashion and shaping your headstocks in that fashion with a router bit. However, on a curvy, skinny headstock like this, it is just fraught with danger and tear out and other kinds of difficulty to use a router bit here especially since I have such a thick ebony plate on the front, and that's just going to be, uh, I don't know, pretty disastrous on a router bit, again, with these curves and the changing grain direction. So what the Robo Sander is, is it's basically the abrasive equivalent of a flush trim router bit. And you know what? Here it is, just because I like to explain things with props, so if you know what a, route, a flush trim router bit looks like, you've got your, your cutter and then a bearing on the top so that that bearing can run against your template and duplicate things to that template perfectly. This does the same thing, but it's held in a drill press and instead of a cutter, which can dig in and tear out and uh, get angry and throw the workpiece and chop off fingers and all kinds of chaos, <laughs> the, an abrasive sleeve isn't going to do any of that. So it's a lot safer, it's a lot less temperamental on your workpiece. So I really like to use it in kind of tight, uh, dicey situations with changing grain direction, as we find here on this headstock shape.
Okay, and so the Robo Sander has duplicated my template shape onto there. It never gets it completely flush like a flush trim router bit would. It always leaves just a tiny little lip all the way around, but it's a consistent lip and it's tiny, so it's actually not a problem. Um, but that's always something to keep in mind when you're using something like an, uh, this abrasive sleeve equivalent of a flush trim router bit rather than an actual flush trim router bit. Doesn't get it truly flush. So in some cases, if you're using that for certain parts, you would have to account for the amount of trim that it leaves uh, in however your designs are laid out. Something to consider. Now, before I remove this, we want to take uh, one of these transfer punches. I believe it's this size right here. Yep, that fits perfectly in my template. And we're going to punch out our hole locations. There we have our marks. So now I'm going to go ahead and drill these out with a 3 8 of an inch Forstner bit on the drill press. Back in a minute. I did a couple of things off camera just to keep the ball rolling here in the shop. Sometimes it helps to put the camera to the side and just knock out some steps. So I did the mortise and tenon neck joint and I also, as you can see, attached the fretboard. Okay, and I'm going to kind of run us through today pretty quickly too because I've got a lot of neck carving to do and I could spend a great deal of time covering every little nitty gritty detail, which I do cover in my online course, Building an OM Acoustic. But here I'm just gonna kind of give you a breeze through of some of the key points here with neck carving. So I'm starting out right now, simply by bringing down all the excess mahogany that is sitting outside of the fretboard. After I glue the fretboard on, there's always a lot of neck blank material that is outside of it and we're going to bring that in. And so I can do that nice and easily with a spoke shave. You can see this thing is just a beast. Okay, so I just cut two troughs here with a half round rasp and the reason for these troughs is they're going to become our depth markers for the nut end of the neck and for the heel end of the neck. So we're going to have a different depth over here and then it's going to taper up to a slightly thicker neck on this end. This is the point now where I can begin true carving, the real act of sculpture, which is neck carving. And what that's going to involve is essentially cutting a carving, a series of facets all along the shaft of the neck in order to develop its contour. And at the same time, as I'm cutting those, I have to be attentive enough to what I'm doing to notice when I need to do work on the cheeks area and the heel area and blend that in with the contour facets that I'm developing on the next shot. Okay, so now we are, uh, we've gone into the second day of carving this neck right now. 
You can see I'm very close to the end, but this is the point where I'm going to look a little more closely at some of the details around the cheeks and around the heel. The shaft, very simple what I'm doing at this point. At this point, I'm literally just taking it down with my sheet of 40 grit sandpaper. Yes, 4D grit. So it's extraordinarily uh, fast cutting. And I'm just taking this, and if I hold it taut at the sides like this, it will carry me down the rest of the way to those little trough marks that I made earlier. That's how I know when I'm done. But I don't want to get there all at once. I want to really start using a, a little bit of artistic discernment and my, my sculpting ability to carve out these cheeks and the heel appropriately as I sneak up on those two marks. All right, ladies and gentlemen, dudes and dudettes, at long last, after about two and a half days of carving this and fine tuning some of the finer little details around the cheeks and the heel. This is looking pretty good. There might be a little more fine tuning right before I attach this to the body and definitely a little bit before final uh, finish prep. But for now, we're in a good place. The drum! No, it's a guitar. But you can play it like a drum. It's kind of fun. But that's not what we're here to do. And now I'm loading up the guitar in the carrier and adjusting the heights at each of the four locations until the guitar is level. Here's a quick little tip for getting that fourth point, getting it to not wobble. Get your three points set up so that they're perfectly level, and then you simply raise the fourth point up to meet the bottom of the guitar. Okay, so I made a test cut here right on the guitar itself. I don't necessarily advise doing your test cuts right on the guitar, but if you've been doing this a while and you're very confident that you're either basically going to nail it the first time you do the setup or that it's just going to need a minor tweak afterwards, you can just do your test cut right under where the fretboard tongue and the heel is going to completely cover your binding anyway. But when you're more new to this, you would use some sort of scrap material up on a block or something like that to create some channels and figure this out that way because when you're new to this you're likely going to be doing more than just a, a minor little touch up you're probably gonna well there's just a good chance that you're gonna get it wrong in a significant way and have to make a lot of adjustments so that's just a little uh, detail right there about doing test cuts but hey you can do a test cut right in this spot so this looks pretty good so I've got this here, damn near perfect. Channels are cut. I'll have you take a look at them right here. They came out great. I was a little worried about that extra height for those channels and whether or not that was going to be a little rough on the the bit and on the uh, particularly on the spruce top and cause a little bit of tear out just from overworking that bit a little bit. But I've got my binding strips removed from the side bending machine now and i'm ready to go ahead and attach these i'm going to go ahead and do that off camera i've actually installed the neck and radius the fretboard okay and a couple other 
things here and there to get it to this state or this stage that we have it right now where it is ready to have the frets installed. And I'm gonna take an opportunity with this and I'm gonna actually give you guys just a fret hammering technique tutorial right here, right now, let's get started. So first of all, a couple prerequisites here just to get started and get yourselves to this stage that I'm at right here. As you can see, I've masked off the fretboard. Um, this is one to protect the fretboard from the hammer, although it being a brass head, it actually can't do too much damage to the fretboard surface. Um, but if you really miss a fret and you're swinging pretty hard, you can leave a little micro indentation on the wood. Uh, it's all, but primarily, actually more so than that, I do the tape so that I can prepare these fret slots, which I've already done here. So that's another thing you have to do. You have to have your fret slots prepared. What do I mean by having them prepared? Well, one, they have to be deep enough. And at this stage, it's always worth just double checking that your fret slots are deep enough that the tang is not going to bottom out. Uh, in addition to that, all of my fret slots have a tiny bevel that I've filed into the top of it with just a little needle file, a triangular needle file like you see here. I really like this diamond one. Not sure where I got it, but um, it works well. The reason for putting uh, just a subtle bevel, not a huge bevel, just a subtle bevel into each the top of each fret is to mitigate the problem of chip out. If you have a fret end that lifts up throughout the process, that tang as it comes up and exits, here I'll show you a fret. The tang is the bottom portion that actually embeds into the wood. As that comes up and exits the slot, if you have no bevel on it and it's just a straight 90 degree turn there, 90 degree angle, then that tang is going to catch on the edge of the wood and pop off a chip. This is especially problematic with ebony, which this is ebony. So we definitely want to do that here. Although it's not a bad idea to just do it on uh, no matter what wood you're using. Now I did say mitigates the problem uh, generally, you don't want the tang to come back up. Usually that means you did something wrong with your hammering technique. Uh, but hey, it happens. And if it does happen, we want less chip out uh, than we would normally get. Uh, not to mention, it's worth mentioning that every guitar at some point, some old repair man or woman is going to take his nippers and pull those frets off. And when he does that, he will be much happier if he's not getting huge chunks of wood that come up with the fret and hey that old man or woman might be you so be kind to your future self and then lastly i want to mention that i have this block here it's good to have a block where you just drill a bunch of holes in it and mark one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty 20 holes here. Um, I might have up to 24 holes depending on how many frets my guitar has. So I think you get the idea here. This is so we can cut out an individual sized fret for each space because, um, you know, we have a taper to our fretboard, so we're going to have larger, require longer fret wire down at the end as opposed to at the top. And these are all cut, by the way so that they are just a little bit, about an eighth of an inch, longer on each side. So I have about an eighth of an inch overhang on each side. And that is simply because when you nip these, there's a tendency for the tang to either just get a little damaged or to even get kind of mangled and bent over to the side. And if you have that mangled tang right over your fret slot, when you go and hammer it, you are going to then mangle the fret slot. And then you're really in a world of trouble then. So to avoid that, we want to cut these long so that the mangled portion will sit outside of the uh, footprint of the fretboard. And lastly, I just want to say that th this fret wire, this Evo Gold fret wire, it's not nickel silver, it's Evo, Evo Gold. That won't matter for the rest of what we're doing though. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that. 
This is Evo Gold and it's already bent. I actually buy them in pre-bent coils just because it, it makes sense for me to do that. And uh, But a lot of you guys might be buy, buying your fret wire as straight rods, in which case you have to bend it in a fret bender yourselves. And you always want to bend these to an over radius to whatever radius your fretboard is. Okay? Keep that in mind. All right. Let's get started uh, with some actual technique here. So I've got my fretting hammer here. This is uh, a Stumac hammer. And actually, I have two different hammers, both from Stuart McDonald. I'm not sure if one is like a first generation, and then I think this would be the second generation, if that's true. Or maybe Stumac sells both of these hammers. What I do know, though, is that they have the key difference of the fact that this hammer, the black one right here, has shot in the head. So shot like, you know, shotgun shell shot, little beads. And uh, that's to prevent recoil. This one does not have any shot in it. It does have a plastic head on one side, um, but we won't be using that. We're gonna be using the brass side only because brass is nice and hard, but it is softer than our fret wire. And if you're using nickel silver, doesn't matter what fret wire you're using, it's softer than even the nickel silver is. Um, but it's definitely softer than Evo Gold. And we're using Evo Gold. I brought up the two different hammers only to say that I notice zero difference between both of them, even the one with the shot in there. They feel the same to me. So if you happen to see both of these out on the market, uh, either of them work, in my opinion. My humble opinion. So we're going to go ahead and use this one right here. This is important. Speaking of shot, this bag right here is a rifle rest, actually. And it is a bag filled with sand. Um, it could be filled with shot. It could be filled with really any sort of loose material so that we don't get recoil. You can't just use any old neck rest for fretting because you will have a lot of recoil. So for example, the neck rocker that Stu Max sells and makes, that's not gonna work here. Uh, just pounding away on top of a piece of wood like that is going to generate too much recoil. The bag filled with shot works really good. And hey, here's a cool tip. The poor man's neck rest, in this case, for fretting, is a bag filled with rice wrapped in duct tape. That's actually what I started out with, and <laughs> it works just the same. It just looks a little janky on camera, um, and I like these rifle rests. They work really nicely. All right, let's go ahead and do it. So you're going to take your first piece of fret wire, I've got my bag underneath. I don't want it just sitting out away from where I'm working. So this bag is always gonna follow me as I go fret to fret. I'm gonna place my fret right on there. Remembering that I cut it a little extra long and I want to remember to leave that excess hanging out over the ends um, so I don't damage the edge of my fret slots. I'm just going to balance it there with my finger and the back part of my hand is going to gently uh, put pressure down on the neck. Okay? Gently. So I'm balancing that there and if I care about my finger I'm going to push it over to the side a little bit so I don't hit it. And I'm going to give a nice sharp stroke right on the end just like that. Okay? And now I'm going to take my finger if I care about it and slide it over to the other side, and another sharp stroke, just like that. And so, what I have now is both the ends are seated, and in the middle, it's sticking up like this. There's an arch in the middle, okay? Now, I have to behave myself here, because if I just whack this right in the middle now, what's gonna happen is one or both of these ends are going to pop right back up and probably take uh, little bits of wood with it. And I say little bits because we did the right thing and we beveled that slot beforehand. So that way we get minimal chip out. 
but hey, we don't want to get any chip out, so we're just not going to hit this square in the middle. What I'm going to do instead is work my way from the secured ends in towards the middle on one side and then the other side and then back to this side, back to this side until I've kind of pushed. You can think of it like you're squeezing an air bubble from both sides towards the middle. Okay, so I'll show you what I mean. And I do this with nice little quick double taps. All my strokes, by the way, are, are hard. These are good, solid strokes. Okay, it actually helps to have a drummer's grip to have played the drums at some point. So I grew up playing the drums actually and creating that fulcrum point so that you can snap the hammer from the wrist is much better for the sake of power and accuracy than if you were to just death grip the hammer like this and just kind of swing it while holding that death grip. The reason for that is I can get a lot of power from my wrist without having to move my arm and lose all that accuracy. See that? Okay. Now if I death grip it to get that same power, I got to lift the hammer up way higher and I'm going to end up missing and maybe hitting my finger, which that would really hurt. Um, by the way, there's no amount of extra tapping here at the end that's harmful. I'm not indenting the fret wire. Uh, if anything, it's indenting the head of the hammer. So you can just kind of go to town if you think maybe you haven't secured it enough in one area. If you look at it from the side, you might see it lifted up in the middle or, or on the ends. And you can just give it a couple extra taps uh, just to be sure. So that's one piece of fret wire there. Let's go ahead and do another one. And I'll keep talking. So I'm going to slide this over again because we need this bag to follow us fret to fret. I'm going to place my wire right there, leaving the ends hanging out. Slide my finger over just a hair. And remember the back of my hand is gently maintaining pressure. Good hard tap. Slide that finger over. Good hard tap. Don't be afraid to give it a good hard tap. And just to show that you shouldn't be afraid of this. Look at that. With that tape on there, I can hit the fretboard. I'm not afraid to do that, truly. All right, so I've got the two ends secured and I've got my arch in the middle. And I'm gonna, now my hand, my finger doesn't need to be there, but my hand still needs to gently maintain down pressure while I do my double taps. Okay, next one, slide it over. Um, when we talk about those double taps, the reason I do the double taps, this might be a little subtle, but, because you could just do a single tap, go to the other side, single tap, and just keep walking your way inward. I like the double tap because what I'm doing with that first tap is I'm swinging and I'm hitting exactly where the fret is already completely secured. Essentially, I'm hitting where I don't even need to hit. It's already secured there. But that's really just my lineup stroke. And then that second rapid hit is just a hair beyond that lineup stroke. And in that way, I'm not going to aim for this spot right here and accidentally hit it square in the middle and have the ends pop out. So that's why I'm doing that sort of rapid fire jackhammer stroke. Um, for me at least, it helps with accuracy. All right, I'll do one more here with a little less explanation, maybe no explanation I'll do for this one. Just so you can see uh, what it looks like when I'm not yammering away.
Okay. There we have it, guys. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get the rest of these in here. Uh, by the way, you might be wondering how am I going to get these uh, frets over the tongue here because we actually have an issue. The sound box, you know, I said recoil was sort of the enemy of what we're doing right now. And the sound box is basically, if I were to design something to create recoil, if I wanted to do that, I couldn't do much better than the acoustic guitar sound box. So we sort of have a problem there when we're hammering over here and this is just recoiling away like crazy. So we need to mute that recoil. And just to show you how I do that, I like to use this tool here. It's another, Jesus, this whole thing seems like a Stumac advertisement and I swear it's not. Um, I, I don't have any of affiliation with them. I don't do, you know, marketing for them, but Hey, this happens to be another Stumac tool. This is, uh, the fret buck is what they call this. This was actually developed in the Taylor guitar factory, which is kind of cool. And, um, then I guess they, you know, sold the idea to Stumac and they sell it. And, uh, the way this works is you pass this in through the sound hole, tighten it up and it, solves the problem of all that recoil there. And then you just hammer these frets in, no different than how I was hammering these, just with this big apparatus uh, hanging onto the fretboard tongue area. Okay, so here I am in the finishing room now. It's been about two hours since I did my last coat. Two hours is kind of like a bare minimum waiting time for me and even then after two hours when I go to pick this up if it feels even a little bit gummy then I didn't wait long enough um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just go through the process of one of my coats this won't be a an exhaustive tutorial on applying a finish that's a really difficult thing to do actually it's very involved and uh, I do teach a course on this though, by the way, called True Oil Finishing, a method for acoustic guitar. And by the way, if you buy the Building an OM acoustic course, the True Oil course is included in that at the end. So you, you just get both things there. But if you wanted just the True Oil course, you can buy that separately. Let's go ahead and do a coat. I've got some True Oil mixed up right here. I like to thin it out with mineral spirits. There's already mineral spirits in the proprietary mixture that is true oil. So it's a good solvent to do or thinner to use to thin out your true oil. I always thin it out by 25%. Um, basically what I mean by that is uh, three parts true oil to one part mineral spirits. So 75% of this is the original true oil, 25% is thinner, mineral spirits. Okay, so we'll open this up. This, by the way, is the, uh, this will be the 15th coat that I'm applying. I have little tick marks here to indicate which coat I'm at. I've got two pads, okay? There's wool inside of here, and the outer covering is just some uh, lint-free cotton. <coughs> I buy these from Joann Fabrics and just cut them up myself, and I wash them two or three times to get, there's a material called sizing that is on new fabric. It's a starchy stiffener uh, material that comes out through washing, so if you just use new material, it's gonna, you're gonna notice a lot of fuzzies or little lint bits. That's the sizing. You're gonna notice it in your finish and that's no good. So just wash them several times to get the sizing out of there. So here's the main pad. This is a detail pad called a carrot, which is really, really looks like a carrot. And uh, this is really useful for finishing a guitar as a complete object. Hold on, someone's calling me. Okay, so we will take this down, 
and take it over here to the bench. And we're going to start off. There's actually sort of an, an order of operations that I follow. I can mix it up a little bit, and sometimes I do, depending, because it really, you know, finishing isn't more of an art than an exact science. But in general, I follow the pattern that you're about to see, which is going to start with the headstock, then the soundboard, and then I'm going to get the end wedge here. Oh, I'll be getting the bridge as well. Don't forget the bridge. And then we're going to finish off by hanging this up and doing the rest of the guitar, which includes the sides, the back, and the contours of the neck. So I'm going to charge up my pad. Now this is a new clean pad. So I'm going to hold this here for five to 10 seconds. And then I'm going to do that again in another spot on the pad. Get it nice and charged up. Okay. And now comes the beating. So I just use this part of my bench here. You could have a separate piece of scrap wood if you don't want to get finish all over your bench, but this is a dedicated space for me, so I like to just do this. And you want to actually beat this down pretty hard. What you're trying to do is work the material through the outer sheathing, that lint-free cloth, and into the wool on the inside. And um, basically it's because we don't want to go to the guitar and spread all of this thick, wet finish onto the surface because it's just going to be too much. As I get started with this, on the headstock here, it'll be kind of slippery at first, but very quickly, because I've beaten it onto the bench there, very quickly this starts to feel, I feel friction. Initially it's slippery and then very quickly I can feel a drag to it because I am applying, that's telling me that I am applying this very, very thin. So thin that I, to my, to my eyes and to my senses, it seems like I'm doing nothing. So if you're new to this, that's actually a good thing. If you feel like when you're spreading the true oil, if it feels like you're doing nothing, <laughs> then that's actually a good sign that you're not overdoing it. It's one of the biggest uh, learning curves within oil finishing like this is just, you want to, everyone at first, lays it on too thick. All right, so there's a nice drag to that. Okay, so that's the headstock. Now on to the carrot, my little detail pad here. Let's charge this up. It's a lot smaller, so I don't need to charge it up nearly as much. And I'm going to do the same thing with my little detail pad. Where am I going with this? I'm going to do the details, the inside corners around the fretboard and the bridge. So first I'm just going to kind of deposit the true oil on there. I like to get the inside of the sound hole here too. And I'm going to get all of these inside corners near the bridge. Fun fact here, my bridge is actually designed to work well with hand rubbed finishes because it doesn't have straight 90 uh, corners like a traditional type of bridge would. 
everything is beveled inward, which is actually what old classical guitar makers used to do because everything was hand rubbed finishes then. So they would design their bridges so that it was actually possible to do what I'm doing right here. Whereas if you have a straight 90 degree corner, it's very difficult technique wise to actually be able to finish into that space. With my bridge built this way, I can get into that corner and even ride up onto the bridge. Now you'll, you'll notice out there that some people finish their bridge, um, some people don't finish their bridge. Most bridges are not finished, especially in the much more common lacquer, spray lacquer world. People tend to mask off their bridge and because it's made out of, usually made out of something like ebony, it's just left as raw wood. Maybe finished with a boiled linseed oil or something like that after the fact but often raw wood. As you can see, there is a lot of attention that I'm spending here with the carrot, doing the detail work. It's actually the most important, or I should say the easiest part to mess up is these little inside corners. So I spend a great deal of time rubbing this out to make sure it flattens out and I don't get any mounds of finish. I want everything to be evenly distributed. And once again, I want to feel that drag from the cloth, which tells me that I've uh, rub the finish out thin enough that it's actually starting to drag and the cloth feels dry. All right, now I'm gonna do the rest of the soundboard, but before I do, I can hold this up to the light here and just make sure that I don't see any issues with what I just did. Okay, ready to proceed. So, five to ten seconds again, charge this up. Um, I'm only gonna do that once here. So in the beginning, I charge it up more. I you know, did five to ten seconds twice. But once this, once you get going, you only have to give it little uh, injections of true oil. Always beat it down. And first I'm just going to deposit some of the material on there and then rub it out. All right, so I'm gonna stop talking now and we'll kind of fast forward. I'll give you a speed through of the rest of this process visually. And hey, if you want to learn more, buy my courses.
right, here we go guys. This is guitar number 106. to play kind of dynamically there and you know not just strum out a bunch of chords so you could hear the balance between the bass and the trebles which is really good um, and obviously I mean I almost don't even have to say that it projects and sustains So yeah, this is really exciting. I'm not gonna play this much. I'm, by the way, this is feeding directly into my uh, microphone on my GoPro camera. This is not a sophisticated recording setup. I simply don't have anything like that. That's just not the kind of thing that I do. I don't really have like a fancy audio engineering setup like other um, online people do, YouTubers and such. Um, but that's okay. So you got to hear it at least through the shotgun mic on my GoPro, which is okay, actually. It's pretty good. And uh, now I'm going to actually go through the guitar, and I think this will be educational for a lot of you builders out there. And I'm just going to talk about the different features on the guitar and why I did what I did, yada yada. All right, let's get into it. All right, so we'll just start from the headstock and work our way down. Obviously, the first thing that jumps out to you here is the wacky orientation of the tuners and the tuners themselves, which are themselves atypical. These are Steinberger gearless tuners, and so they work completely different from your regular tuner that twists around the post. These you actually lock into a hole in the post, and then the post dives down into the headstock so there's no gears that connect together so hence there's no gear ratio but they have the equivalent of a 40 to 1 gear ratio which if you're familiar with gear ratios the highest gear ratio that i know of outside of this 40 to 1 is 21 to 1 so it's uh, about double plus they're just really simple and quick to change strings on because you just pass them through the hole and lock them down, and uh, that's it. Then you tune them up. Now, I've actually countersunk these into the headstock, so these aren't resting right on the finish of the headplate. They're actually countersunk down into the headplate. And I do that really for aesthetic reasons, having to do with the finish deforming, or if it were a lacquer finish, it'd be chipping around the edges. This is a true oil finish, by the way. Here, I'll give you a shot of these on the back side. So this is actually where you tune a guitar like this on the back, not on the front. It's a little deceiving. You might think you turn these. Those are the string locks that I was just talking about. Okay, so the head plate itself is Macassar ebony, which is like this really nice stripey ebony. It has like caramel bands or stripes throughout it. You'll see more of it as we travel down through the fretboard and the bridge because they are both Macassar ebony as well. Okay, our nut here, this is a bone nut. I always use bone nuts. Actually, that's not true. I have made nuts out of ebony, nuts and saddles, but uh, those are few and far between. Usually it's bone, never plastic, or any other synthetics like tusk and all that. Uh, I like the real thing. Oh, one more thing about the tuners before we jump to the fretboard is the orientation here gives us a straight pull across the nut. So a straight pull of the strings, rather than the strings hitting the nut and then splaying off to the side, as you see on so many other guitars, which is just a less efficient way to use the string's energy budget. Okay, we want that force vector going in one direction, straight down, rather than in two directions, down and across. All right, now let's jump over to the fingerboard, fretboard, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so Macassar Ebony as well, and David really wanted to have some abalone dots in here. I haven't 
used abalone before and I gotta say it was a bit of a pain in the butt <laughs> to get them in there. I actually had to pop a couple of them out a couple times just because it has these blackish streaks and as you sand and level the shell material down and any of you guys who have worked with any kind of shell like mother of pearl or abalone know that as you sand it down you reveal different layers and so the look that you have on the top surface when you install it isn't necessarily what you get as you um, explore through those layers and with the abalone in particular it was just a back and forth game of you know i'd be leveling the the fretboard after they were all in there and one of them would get this nasty black mark right in the middle and then uh, by the time i cleaned that up there'd be another black mark appearing somewhere else so i just felt like i was chasing my tail trying to get them all to look good but with some careful and particular work on each one individually and with popping them out and just putting new ones in a couple times i ended up getting a nice consistent greenish abalone look without big nasty black splotches there's a little bit of black in there but it's uh, attractive looking it actually looks right okay and while we're at the fretboard i think it's appropriate to talk about scale length this is a 25.34 inch scale length which is your orchestra model scale length okay that is considered by the way long scale now the difference between long scale and short scale to the player essentially is that the long scale is going to feel tighter it's going to be the strings are literally at a higher tension and the short scale is going to feel looser so it's easier to do bends and things like that on that short scale instrument many people like the long scale because it projects better you actually get a different tone out of having higher tension and generally um, all the things that we want like more sustain more projection more volume come from the instrument being high tension you can prove this to yourself just by down tuning the strings on any guitar and yeah it's going to sound bad because it's going to be out of tune uh, but also you're going to have a decrease in all those things that i mentioned so long scale generally speaking, is good for tone, uh, but also it's good for pitch stability while you're playing, which if you're a player who doesn't want to bend notes, right, that's just not how you play, maybe you play blue, bluegrass or something like that, where you're just doing clean runs, then you actually want the string to be nice and tight and stable and not to be accidentally bending slightly as you play it, which would throw your pitch off you know saying all that kind of makes short scale seem like it's a bad thing it's really not i love a triple o is a short scale version of the om and i love the triple o as much it's it's just different um, i love it as much as the om that guitar i find to be better for more of like lead playing especially if you do play the blues or you just like to bend notes and do things like that you can be more expressive on a short scale guitar because of the looseness the fret wire here is evo gold uh, evo gold is not actually gold don't get excited don't pluck it out of your guitar and try and hawk it at a gold, cash for gold place it is a copper alloy it naturally has that gold color, which looks really cool, but honestly, that's not the reason to use it for the color. It is a much more durable and wear resistant material than nickel silver. It's not as wear resistant as stainless steel, but honestly, it doesn't need to be as wear resistant as stainless steel. Um, I think stainless steel is, is pretty much overkill. You, you don't need stainless steel when you have something like Evo Gold, I'd say. Um, stainless steel is kind of like hell on your tools. Uh, okay, so let's keep on going down to the body. There it is. So the soundboard is Sitka Spruce. And uh, the back is Dalbergia Tucurensis which is commonly called Nicaraguan Rosewood. Which is a, I say that and it sounds like it's not a true rosewood. Uh, Dalbergia is a true rosewood. Um, and what might throw you off here is that also it doesn't really look 
like a typical rosewood because usually rosewoods have that kind of purplish, blackish purplish colors. Um, but this is really like a sandstone orangey brown. And actually a lot of the Nicaraguan rosewood that I've seen does have that purplish color. But this just happens to be on the far lighter end of the spectrum. Because all woods, and you see this a lot with mahogany, which I know a lot of you guys work with, um, all woods have a, a range of color tones that that can be a you know can be found amongst them, and uh, Nicaraguan rosewood just has a pretty wide range, I've found. Um, so yeah, we actually me and David picked this one out. Um, I had him on you know the phone while I was at Hearn Hardwoods, and we picked this one out specially just for that lighter color that look and the cool sapwood stripe right down the middle there okay um the rosette itself is made out of offcuts from the back and the sides okay so that is also nicaraguan rosewood it is cut into individual slices and assembled so that the grain always moves radially out from the center. I use a special jig that I also make in the shop here and sell to you guys. It's called the Radial Rosette Maker. A lot of you guys out there have the jig already, so you know what I'm talking about. And it makes the job of making rosettes like this uh, really fast and really easy. It makes it a cut and dry process, really. And so traveling from the soundboard now to the bridge, we've got a sort of newish bridge design that I've been doing. I'm sure you guys have seen some of the other wackier designs I've done. This one's pretty slim and trimmed down, which is great for bridges. Obviously you want bridges to have a very low weight and a very low footprint on the top. And I think this bridge really achieves that. I also designed this bridge. Oddly enough, I designed it to make finishing easier. So here's the deal. Classical makers, if you go back far enough, it was all hand rubbed finishes that they were using. And so they actually designed their bridges. If you look at old classical bridges or even new ones, because uh, let's face it, in the classical world tradition is strong. Tradition is everything. And so everything kind of looks like it did in the beginning. But uh, the point I'm getting at is classical bridges have all these contours and this rounded over look to it. It's not boxy like a Martin guitar bridge is. And the reason for that is because when you're hand rubbing a finish on an instrument that is fully assembled, meaning the bridge is attached and the neck is attached, if you have, if you're trying to rub into the corners where you have this steep 90 degree wall, like you might see on a boxier bridge, it's impossible. Uh, I'll, I'll say it's very, very difficult, but it might even be impossible to get the finish to really spread out evenly and be clean and uh, level with the surrounding finish in those corners. Uh, trust me, I've tried forever to get... Um, hand rubbed finishes to look good with boxy bridges and I can get them pretty close but you can always if you look at it inspect it close enough you can always kind of tell that there's something going on right in those 90 degree corners. Now if you design your bridge more like a classical bridge you with these curves and contours coming up like this over the bridge your rag can just kind of sweep right over the bridge and it's a lot easier to get a seamless look. So that might be interesting to some of you guys if you're struggling with finishing around the bridge, which I know is a common struggle. Um, of course, a lot of people just finish uh, before they attach the bridge and that's fine. So let's see what else. It's a bone saddle, not surprising because we have a bone nut. This saddle is fully intonated and it has channels cut for the strings to rest in. So typically on the guitar, you obviously have slots cut into the nut, but your typical guitar won't have slots cut into the saddle. 
the strings will just uh, naturally kind of pull to where they're going to pull and th that's where they'll stay. But if you cut notches into the saddle, you can actually direct where those strings are supposed to be and set the string spacing on the saddle side a little more evenly. Furthermore, it's never going to shift or slide when you're playing very vigor vigorously, which you can actually do um, if you don't have notches cut. And, uh, and then finally, at, the, uh, at each of these notches, I have separately intonated each string to get the intonation just a little bit better than you naturally get from saddle that is not fully compensated. And then the pins, we got to talk about the pins, right? Because those look pretty cool. This design on the top of the pins is called Parisian Eye. I don't make these, I order them from LMI. That's Luthier's Mercantile. So if you guys are interested in these pins, go, go to LMI and check them out. They are really cool. They're called, if you type in Parisian Eye, you should be able to find them. These are unslotted bridge pins. So there's no slot in the pin itself, which means that the bridge itself has to be slotted and has been slotted to accept the string, which tonally is the best way of doing it. And mm, I could get into why, but I don't know if I want to go that deep. I think a lot of you, a lot of you guys know why. Well, I'll talk about it a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about it a little bit. Let's get into it. Okay. So you can have a slotted bridge pin. Let me go get one and I'll show you. Uh, now you guys got me going into the weeds here. All right, so I got both a slotted bridge pin and an unslotted bridge pin. So I can show you the difference. Many of you know the difference, but... So there's the slot that I'm talking about. So this is kind of just a, an easy, quicker, lazier way of fastening your strings to the bridge because you don't have to cut notches or slots into the bridge itself the thickness, the gauge of the string will simply rest in that giant slot right there. Now these are perfectly smooth all the way around. These are unslotted. The string does not slot into this. So therefore we need to cut slots into the bridge itself, which means that the ball end of the string is not going to jam up against the pin. Rather the ball end of the string is going to sit just a little bit ahead of the pin itself and will be fully resting on the bridge plate. And that is very important for the anchoring and the uh, resonant potential that you get from a more perfect anchoring to that bridge plate. Furthermore, when you slot your bridge, you can curve and ramp that slot uh, like this, right? To create a ramp that sets your angle towards the saddle so you can appropriately give yourself more or less angle uh, depending on whether or not you need it. You can control that angle and that's very good for tone also. Okay, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> we, we got in and out of that pretty, pretty quickly. Let's uh, jump over to uh, well, we haven't talked about the bracing. You can't see the bracing. I could grab the camera and pull it down. Okay, so you can't see the bracing too easily with the strings on like this, but this is a lattice braced back, or I call it a modified lattice bracing. And I just like the lattice bracing. I find, or I think that in theory, it is the appropriate way to brace a back. Ladder bracing is the standard, but really that has become the standard for more economical reasons. It's very easy to do ladder bracing. Now, in all seriousness, the back is not nearly as important of a tone contributor than the top. And so being a bit more economical with your bracing strategy, I think is okay. I'm not against ladder braced guitars and I still build some of them. But uh, if I'm asked what is the most appropriate way to brace a back, I think it's the lattice bracing. And um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure if it makes a noticeable difference yet. I've only done about five or six lattice braced guitars, but um, at least in theory, it makes sense to me. So I'm gonna keep doing them. And the soundboard bracing is X bracing. X bracing is always the king. <laughs> Almost everyone does uh, X bracing on steel string acoustic guitars for the top. Um, everyone has kind of like their own little modification of it. Uh, I definitely make sure my braces are taller and skinnier than your typical Martin X bracing. I think tall and skinny a la the cube rule is the way to go. Uh, but yeah, other than that, I mean, it's an X brace and I voiced it and um, not much else to say about that. Okay, uh, let's see. Picking up the pieces here. Is there anything else left to talk about? It's Honduran mahogany for the neck. It's a nice C-shaped neck. And an inch and three quarters, I believe, at the nut. Um, yeah, an inch and three quarters. And uh, ebony binding. Okay. Well, just wanted to share that with you guys. This is ready. Well, almost ready. I actually still have to put a pick guard on it. You can see no pick guard right now. Some gu guitars I put a pick guard on, some I don't. Uh, it all depends on the player's preference. If you're purely a finger style player, you might desire not having one on your top. But most people do want a pick guard, uh, even if they only pick occasionally with a an actual plastic pick. So I use Mylar for the pick guards. And this is what it will look like when it has the pick guard on there. Here's my template. Something like that. Um, not that thick. Again, this is just a template. But uh, the only reason I haven't put the pick guard on is because I'm waiting on the mylar. I am out of a material. But once that pick guard goes on there, this thing is ready to go in the case and be shipped to California. All right, guys. That's all I got for you today. I hope you got something out of that. Let me know what you think. Let me know uh, what you think of some of my ideas there or the guitar itself. Um, I, I just love feedback. So I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.